having your regular client list and having your administrative information in one spot is a really, really good start. And if you can do those things, then you can start planning for things like, you know, saving, mm -hmm. saving your business expenses, saving enough to pay yourself a salary if there's an emergency and you can't work for six months or saving enough for insurance or saving enough, you know, saving enough to pay somebody to close your practice or, you know, all of these sorts of things. Welcome to the Colleague Down the Hall podcast. This episode is sponsored by the Collab Oasis Clinical Consultation Groups. Hi, I'm Janine Wolf, and I'm your colleague down the hall. I have a passion for helping fellow therapists get the clinical and collegial support we all need to do this work. And wow, it just keeps getting harder every day. I'm the founder and facilitator of the Collab Oasis Clinical Consultation Groups. I have been a social worker for almost 30 years, and I own a successful solo online private practice. More of us than ever are practicing in solo or online practices, and we all need colleagues to process cases with, commiserate with on those really hard days, and also to celebrate our successes with. In this podcast, I'll bring you insights about trends and changes in our field and sit down with amazing therapists who are doing amazing work. We'll discuss fictionalized cases, ways to practice sustainably, and of course, there will be plenty of laughing. I love laughing with friends. I'm so glad to have you as one of my colleagues down the hall. Hello, everyone. You are listening to another episode of the Colleague Down the Hall podcast. I'm your host, Janine Wolf. So excited to be joined today by my good friend, Tamara House. She is a therapist in Paris and my biz buddy, and she has great things to talk about always. But today I have asked her to come on to talk about having a clinical will for your private practice. And I remember when I first heard about this, I was like, wow, it never even occurred to me that I needed something like this. And I suspect there are plenty of people out there that are going to hear this, that are going to be like, what, what is this? So welcome Tamara. Thank you so much for having me. It's always lovely to be on your podcast with you. Yeah. Thank you. So you want to tell us what a clinical will is? Sure. So a clinical will, sometimes known as a professional will, is essentially a directive in case of an emergency. So it's usually document, like a piece of documentation that is produced by a therapist so that in case of something happening to them, there's a procedure in place to let their clients know and take care of closing their practice. And there are various different situations in which a clinical will or professional will might be used. And I think of those in terms of temporary and permanent absences and expected and unexpected absences. So I think of those four different categories. Perfect. Also, we need to keep in mind that one of the important reasons to do this is that if something were to happen to us, and our family is grieving and doing all the other things that they need to do for our end of life wrapping up, of, I guess is a, <laughs> not a great way of saying it. <laughs> they don't, you don't want to like, they're, they're not going to know how to reach your clients. They shouldn't be the ones reaching out to your clients. So this is a way to, to care for your clients and care for your family, right? Absolutely. I think that it's, you know, one of the responsibilities of having a business is thinking about like contingency plans. And so sometimes we think about that in as far as, well, what would happen if I need to take a week off? Or what happens if I go on holiday? And this is essentially just an extension of that. And so what we want to do is, is take care of all the people around us. And you're right that it's going to be a hard time if for some reason I'm not able to inform my clients or be in touch with my clients, then I don't really want my partner, my family to have the responsibility of responding to emails, dealing with my calendar, dealing with bills, things like that because they're probably going to have a lot on their plate already. Now, I just, you know, I just, I don't want to sound like judgmental when I say that, because I do think that sometimes that happens. And sometimes our families will be the ones that have to, you know, deal with the aftermath. But I guess what I'm saying is that I just want to try to relieve that as much as possible. 
And also all of the ethical guidelines that I have read from various different licensing boards and regulatory and ethical bodies in different countries around the topic of clinical wills recommends that we have someone that has the same training or license type as us dealing with our clients. So there are various different aspects of a clinical will. Some of it's financial, some of it's administrative, and some of it is clinical and therapeutic. And so what everything I've read has has stipulated, some of them it's a guideline and some of them it's a requirement that it is someone with the same license type. And some of that is to do with privacy and some of that is to do with professionalism and having the same confidentiality rules. Right. Yeah. And I would also think being in the same state or wherever you region or wherever you are, because we know that those guidelines can differ as well. And it would certainly be helpful for that person to not have to do research around that. Absolutely. It's one of those, it's one of those really tricky things, you know, because I'm sure that you'd be a lovely person to contact my clients if something were to happen to me. And we often say to each other, like, oh, do you need some help with this? Or do you need some help with that if there an emergency comes up for us? But but the reality is like actually technically, if someone gets in touch with your clients, they need to be licensed in the state that you're your client is in. And yeah, okay. I I mean, I don't know. I don't know exactly how boards would like respond in an emergency situation like that. But what we can do is look for somebody that meets the criteria as much as possible in advance. And so I think that that's one of the things that's actually really helpful is having a bit of a guideline for who are you looking for, as well as the practical stuff like does this person have availability to contact all of your clients? Are they easily reachable? You know, do you think your clients will respond well to them, but also that they're licensed in the same place and the same way? Mm -hmm. So most of the people who are familiar with this think about this in terms of being, you know, having death or incapacitation of some sort. But we are also, you mentioned earlier, there's other situations such as maybe having a surgery or going out on maternity leave where you would want to have something similar in place. I did this for a colleague. She was going out on maternity leave and I said, you know, you could have what happened to me and your water breaks and unexpectedly early. And now you're on your way to the hospital. And the last thing you want to do is try to reach your clients. You would just have to, she would just have to reach me. We signed a BAA. I could contact them if she needed to extend her maternity leave or if someone's had surgery and there's been complications than they thought. Once again, not having to do that yourself, but having a colleague and they don't have to have access to all of your records, really just like more of an admin so they can reach out to people. But that's another way that people need to use these, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, there are some situations where I didn't really even know that I would use the information in my clinical will. So, you know, after a bereavement, for example, I didn't work for a few months and and actually a lot of the information that I collated in my clinical will I used. So, you know, I had templates for letting people know that I was unexpectedly going to take some time off. I had templates for updating them. I had, you know, so there's so much stuff that so much preparation that we can put in. I'm not saying everybody has to do absolutely every single thing, but there are so many things that can relieve stress in a moment of difficulty so just having a basic kind of template for you know due to um the uh, you know family circumstances or due to a personal emergency needing to take some time off i think is 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 really helpful and having a kind of system like who's going to let them know do you have a va that could maybe just update them if it's a temporary thing Or is this, you know, something more serious where you'd need a clinician to get in touch with them and provide referrals? So I always have a list of people that I might suggest as referrals as well. And I think parental leave is a really interesting one just because of the unexpected nature of so many things that can come up. So many people say, right, I'm going to work right up until the last minute because we don't get enough parental leave and we don't have enough, you know, and mm-hmm. and there's, you know, finances to plan and things like that. And, and we absolutely can't know what's going to happen. You might be back at work two weeks later. 
I thought I'd be back at work at, you know, three months postpartum and I started working 14 months postpartum, you know, and mm-hmm. couldn't have started any earlier. So I think also part of the the clinical will is writing things down, is preparing, is considering different possibilities, but it's also financial planning as well. Right, right. Okay. So t- talk about that a little bit more about the financial okay. planning. <laughs> okay. Well, so... um. So for example, I suggest um, if you find a person that is going to close your practice for you, whether that's the financial, the administrative, or the therapeutic part of your practice, I suggest saving some money to pay them for their time. Um, And it's all very well, you know, if you and I were in the same state, we were licensed the same way. And we said like, oh, yeah, let's be each other's clinical executors. And it's all very well saying that. But one of us is not going to be the other person's clinical executor. (laughs) There's not going to be a reciprocation of this. (laughs) It's it's not a reciprocal (laughs) arrangement. (laughs) So we're not going to be able to help each other out in the same in the same way. And there's a there's a lot of runoff, you know, from. From what I understand from the people that I've spoken to that have been through this process, looking after other people's practices and closing them, there's a lot of runoff. There's a lot of like, you know, things that come up even a year later. So I always suggest saving a part that can and and agreeing that um, with a clinical executor, maybe thinking about multiple clinical executors, maybe Mm -hmm. thinking about if you have an accountant who has access to your, your bank accounts or you know, your, your zero or your QuickBooks or however you reconcile, um, you know, having them be part of the process as well, your financial planner. And so, you know, there are other things that you can do as well. The next thing that I suggest doing, I mean, actually, before you start saving up to pay someone to close your practice is saving your business expenses for three months and then six months, and then saving enough to pay yourself a salary for three months and six months. And so those Mm. are the sort of four steps. And then having a pot to um, pay somebody to help you with closing your practice at whatever their rate is, whether that's their hourly rate or whether you agree a, a particular figure and then potentially involving, you know, more people. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that you know, there are all sorts of other things as well, like, you know, three to six months you know, that might be okay if it's a temporary absence, you know, but you also might want to think about insurance um, for taking breaks uh, due to health or due to an accident or things like that. So there are there are lots of different sort of financial possibilities that people can put in place and everybody would need to speak to their financial planners and and people to make a plan that suits them and their family and their situation. But there are all these things that we often don't don't really think about on the path to sustainability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I really like the idea of multiple people because a couple of summers ago, you and I both were like in crisis at the same time. And we're both saying like, what can I do to help you? And, you know, and so <laughs> having like having several people. So if your go-to person is in their own crisis and they can't do that for you, then, you know, there's some other options there as well. And one of the things that's come up. So Tamara did a training with um, the members of the Collab Oasis consultation groups a while back. And one of them was speaking to me not too long ago saying, you know, I really am. In, the reason I can't like finish this is because I just can't figure out who the person is going to be. And I feel really stuck. And for people who are in solo private practice, it can feel very much that way. Yeah. Yes. So do you, do you have any? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> I think that's often the reason why people don't get all the information written down. Because people feel very stuck about who they're going to choose. It, it's like a massive, it, and, and also being asked to be someone's clinical executor can feel like a massive privilege, such an honor to be trusted, but also so much responsibility, you know? Yeah. And so that's kind of, I think that's kind of scary, that process. But I think it stops people putting all the information down on paper. And so what I always say is just get everything, get everything written down collect all your information in one place so that even if you don't ask somebody by the time something happens, at least then your partner will be able to say, here's all the information. Can one of you help me? You know? Absolutely. Um, So having something is better than nothing. Having something is better than nothing. Absolutely. Good message. Yes. (laughs) 
<laughs> having something is better than nothing. And I think that choosing a person happens last in the process of creating a clinical will. So many people will ask somebody and not write anything down. Oh, wow. Okay. You know? And see, in my mind, I always thought you should pick the person first. And I like that. I think it's a little more freeing to think of the idea of, let me just do all the parts on my end that I can take care of and then take that next step later. But if something happens in the meantime, then there is at least a template and like what someone needs to do. Exactly. Because if I haven't put any of that stuff down and I've just chosen you, then you're going to have to dig around and figure it all out for yourself. And I've made mm -hmm. your life more difficult and not made provision for it and met, you know, like created, created more difficulty, if anything, by bestowing the responsibility upon you and not giving you the tools for it. So yeah, I think absolutely like writing the instructions down using a template. There's plenty of templates out there. There's templates you can buy. There's templates you can download for free. There's just, you know, even having something basic is better than having nothing, you know, even just writing a list of like, so one of the things that I recommend to people when I teach the live rounds of my clinical will course is one of the things I suggest is doing a monthly client list. And lots of people will do this anyway, at the beginning of the month, will you know, export or print or write out a list of all their active clients, make sure you close anyone who isn't active anymore, send them a closing note or a discharge report and, and know exactly who's coming in that month. And then at least if you have that list, mm -hmm. then whoever picks up <laughs> whoever yeah. picks up the information will know who to contact and all that needs to have on it is you you know client names and contact details and to store that somewhere secure right but just to let people know let someone know where they would where they would be able to um, find that so you could use something like um, LastPass or Dashlane, like in LastPass, you can save secure notes, you can add emergency contacts. There are all sorts of other things you could use your EHR. There are lots of different ways of storing the information safely and sharing it with someone. But just as a very absolute basic, I would just recommend creating a client list every month um, somewhere, yeah. in, somewhere in your system securely. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And, and I was going to ask about the password thing because a number of years ago, there was a, a very well-known therapist who died unexpectedly and no one had access to any of his passwords. And it, you know, it created, these are people who are now grieving unexpectedly this horrific loss and they don't have any access. And LastPass is like, don't care if they're dead. We're not going to give you the information. There's no way to get it. So making sure that that information is somewhere that people can access. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I think having official backup you, on some EHRs, you can even add a clinical executor. You can add, um, you can add like a dormant user. You have to ask them often. And I would really love it if EHRs started doing this as like standard practice, you know, adding a backup person that you don't have to pay for necessarily, but just right. could get access. But I have spoken to a couple of um, EHRs directly about it. And, and actually, I have to say that the feedback that I got from them was that it would take time anyway to process something like that because you'd have to provide a death certificate and things like that. And so mm -hmm. there would still be some time where people people weren't notified there still needs to be like a way for people to get access to your schedule to notify people in a timely way otherwise that is going to end up being a partner a parent a sibling who's reading your emails basically right so what are some other tips or things about this you you want to share with us um, I think the client list is is the main thing. I think also mm -hmm. collecting all of your information, administrative information in one place is a really good idea. So, you know, I do this in a, in a Google Doc. I've tried loads of different fancy ways over the years. Like I've tried doing it in Asana and I've done it in Trello and then I did it in ClickUp and then... <laughs> And then in the end, I just made a Google Doc with some tables. <laughs> right. And um, and that's the easiest way to keep everything up to date. And I just keep 
all my practice information in one place. And so I, I always recommend that as well. Just put your license renewal date in there, put your platform providers, where do you host your website? Like, you know, what, what are your, all your email addresses? What is your business bank account? Like, how are you taking payments? Just, just put it all in one place in one document. And if you, if you don't have standard operating procedures, that's kind of next level. But Mm -hmm. just as an absolute basic, I think having your regular client list and having your administrative information in one spot is a really, really good start. And if you can do those things, then you can start planning for things like, you know, saving, Mm -hmm. saving your business expenses, saving enough to pay yourself a salary if there's an emergency and you can't work for six months or saving enough for insurance or saving enough you know, saving enough to pay somebody to close your practice or, you know, all of these sorts of things, you can start, you can start doing that. You can start writing templates and and stuff, but just as a very basic way to get started, those are the things that I would suggest. Yeah. So also, as you were talking, what's coming to mind is all of those things that we have on auto pay platforms and things that we're doing and someone's trying to close out your banking and all that. And these auto pays are hitting and then it's more work to, ask for them to refund you than to contact them and say, hey, they no longer need your services. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things that we can't take care of everything, but we can just take care of a few things, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think as long as we get started, as long as we sort of begin the process, it's really important to remember that it's never really finished. As long as we're in practice, as long as we have a business, whether it's a private practice or any other business, there will there will have to be some sort of process if we're no longer able to participate in it, whether that's because of sickness or because I'm not here anymore. And so we can take care of that. You know, a lot of people don't, a lot of businesses don't. Ours is a little bit it's more sensitive because we're really, we're dealing with taking care of people, dealing with emotions, we're dealing with, you know, confidentiality and privacy. And so it's a little bit different to other parts of my business, you know, for example, where anyone can deal with that and anybody could close those things. We just have to be a little bit more sensitive. And so I think it's important to be thoughtful, but, you know, from the very first client that we get, I think this is sort of part of taking care of our clients. It's a, it's a, it's another aspect of continuity of care, essentially. Right, right. So <laughs> there's lots, I like the that you call it sort of like a living document. That's yes. important because our, our businesses are changing. Our client load is changing. We might be adding other things that we're doing, not just direct client work, but you might be doing intensives or retreats or things like that that might not show up so readily on your day-to-day calendar. But if you're keeping that list, like you were saying, then they're going to know like these are additional people who are going to need to be notified. Yeah, that's interesting, actually. In the last live round, I was working with someone who was talking about what about colleagues? You know, what about if we're booked as a speaker? What if I'm coming on your podcast? Or what if I'm going to be in a summit or a bundle or... I'm going to be speaking at someone's conference, you know, should we collect all that information in one place as well? And I think most of those things my VA would be able to deal with, like if you have a VA, but yes, that all that information should be somewhere. Yeah. Not just in my brain. Like right. the podcast today is only in my brain. I didn't, I didn't because we arranged it very last minute. And <laughs> yes. so I didn't put it in my diary. And then, you know, two hours before I remembered and I wrote it down on a piece of paper, but I was the only person that knew about it today, mm-hmm. you know? So it's important that we make sure that there is a tra- there's a paper trail for right. everything. Right. And, and, you know, if you're doing all the things the way you should, where everything is password protected, would think that you would also need something where they could even just get into your computer before they can access any of those other things. So having that person in LastPass or whatever you're using, or even if you, I don't, it's not secure to keep it all in a notebook in your office, but I know there are people that do that, but making sure somebody knows how to get the ball rolling. So I presumably that's your partner or someone in your family reaching out and saying, Hey, this has occurred. 
I know that you um, had made an arrangement to do this. So just, you know, putting you on notice that now we need this. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the likelihood is like our partners, the people closer to us would still have to be involved in some way. Yeah. There are some things like bank accounts or some things that they might have to be involved in. What I really want to relieve them of is having to deal with any kind of client interaction. Client, yeah. So that's, for me, that's the most important part of, you know, supporting the people in my life is just making sure that clients are taken care of appropriately and and that, you know, my my family are not taking care of um taking care of that. So yeah, I think that there's there's a lot of things that we can do. Everyone's got different systems for passwords and things like that. So you're right. There are some people who just use the same password for everything. I don't recommend doing that. People who just do pet's name one, two, three exclamation mark. If mm -hmm. I've just said your password, please change it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people whose password is password, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, and there are people who write them in a notebook and then they and then they lock them in a drawer and then that's mm -hmm. in a locked cabinet or a locked room. And, and, you know, in some ways, some people would say that that's maybe more secure than other, you know, online methods that may have had breaches. So... Is there a way of really, truly being secure? I think the most important thing is that we make an effort, that we do what we're professionally required to do to protect our clients and ourselves, obviously, in as much as is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the priority then is you start with someone who can take care of your clients. That's the bare minimum of what you need with this professional will so that someone who is a professional who understands working with clients can be the one to reach out. And then much like you were talking about with the tiers of savings, then you've had that maybe in next year, you want to add on some more of these other things that, you know, you want to put in this document. I know that a lot of people get overwhelmed with this type of stuff. And so breaking it down into phases or steps, uh, maybe that would be relieving for people to think about it in that, those terms. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you find a good template, then, you know, you just literally follow the, you know, you just follow, okay, this section, I'm going to put this information in this section, I'm going to put this information in this section. And, you know, in my templates, you just delete the stuff you don't need. And so I think that, I mean, for me, I think the the, the basic, like essential part is getting the information down on paper before choosing someone and then choosing, and then, you know, choosing someone appropriate. And I also think it doesn't need to be like your best friend. It doesn't need to be your supervisor. It can be all of these things. I always sort of think it should be someone who knows me but isn't so attached to me that they wouldn't be able to take care of someone else Yeah, if something happened to me. So that's like the ideal. The thing mm -hmm. is you get to know people, you know, as you make an arrangement with someone, you get to know them and you get closer to them. And then so you might want to bring someone else into the group and, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that. But yeah, I think, you know, and also considering it not just a process that's used in the event of death, like thinking of it as a process that's used in any kind of unexpected emergency, you know, or a tight need for time off. So it could be something that's used when someone's experiencing burnout and they really need some support. You know, recently someone who I'm a clinical executive for got in touch after a bereavement and said, can you just deal with this particular part of it? You know, so they just, all of their inquiries and all of their referrals came to me. And because I have space, because I had space for that, that particular mm -hmm. week, no one was sick at home that week, <laughs> you know, home from school. <laughs> and so I had, um, I had a bit of space. And so I was able to redirect referrals so that's actually we don't think of that as part of a clinical will process but actually just any kind of emergency procedure is sort of an early part of the process like what happens if this happens and so I actually think it's important as part of the clinical will process to start to think about all those different what are you going to do if you get called for jury duty and what are you going to do you know do you have mm -hmm. a preferred referral list and do you have a backup who actually has space in their calendar? Because, you know, there are plenty of people that I would choose to be a clinical executor, but they got 25 or 35 clients 
And so they wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't even have time to notify my clients, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, just thinking about practical stuff, I think is also really helpful. And then maybe the final thing to mention about it is just that we need to, we need to mention it in our informed consent so that clients are aware that if something happens, that they will be contacted by someone else, that we have an agreement with that person, whether you've signed your clinical will document, you've got a BAA, however you arrange that information just to let our clients know, because we don't have BAAs in the UK, but we would sign a clinical will document. We would make sure, you know, in the UK, it's important that the, the other person is also aware of GDPR, which is our privacy regulation. And so they would have to also meet the regulations, the privacy regulations and Europe as well. So you know, I think that letting people know in, in our informed consent, it, it just has, it's just like literally one sentence, making sure mm -hmm. that that's part in the confidentiality section, just explaining that if there was something to happen to me, that I have an agreement with another professional or set of professionals who will then get in touch with you and let you know mm -hmm. and yeah. have access to your records, obviously. Right, right. Yeah, we can't forget the informed consent. That's a good right. reminder. So <laughs> So I know you you have a recorded course. You sometimes run it live. Tell me tell me what is included in the course. Um, I have a training which is a much more systematic and in depth version of this conversation, I suppose, and <laughs> sort of goes through all these different possibilities. I have a checklist for all the different, uh, like a worksheet or a work list for all, all the different ways in which a clinical will might be needed, a template approved by a lawyer and various references. I've added some UK references and some US references as well, because there are lots of different, lots of different resources and things that we can learn about it. What else have I got? I also include my BizHub doc in there, which is just like a nine pound Google doc template mm -hmm. of what I use to keep all of my information. So it's like a hub of my okay. business. So I include that as well. Let me see what else is in there. And then there's a checklist as well, I think. Uh, oh, there's a workbook. Ah, there's a workbook. Okay. Of course, there's a workbook. Okay. <laughs> of course, um, you it's know. probably beautiful too. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like with all courses, there'll be, you know, there'll be like a checklist, a workbook, a training and a template, which is pretty much like the standard, standard format for my courses. And then I've run it live. I've done it live. I did two get it done weeks this year. And I really loved it. It was amazing. And lots of people sign up for Get It Done Weeks. And then they're like a bit afraid to come to the calls. But I run a Facebook group as well for that week. And then so we have prompts. And so I really love doing that as well, because that's kind of it's nice to have a bit of encouragement, a bit of just someone kind of paying attention in case you have a question. And even sometimes we'll sometimes people just prefer to ask the question rather than, you know, listen to the recording, even though they know it's in the recording. They just want like a live person to have a conversation conversation with about it you know because right, there's an right. emotional process to this as well and I think that's important yeah so I mean I whoever's in the course the next time I do a get it done week a live round gets the live round and then usually I promote it just before I do a live round as well just in case so yeah mm -hmm. that's what's inside and you usually usually market that in your Facebook group, which is called Private Practice Info Center. Yeah, usually I mention it in that. Usually I mostly keep in touch with people on my email list, to be honest, okay. like I'm less active on Facebook about especially about promoting courses. I usually just let people know on my email list. And okay. if anyone's keen, then they jump in. Okay. So in the show notes, we will put a link for people who want to inquire about your course or the paperwork, and then also some type of opt-in or freebie where they can get on your list, get something free out of it and get on your list. So if they want to be made aware of these things in the future, they can do that. Thanks so much. I actually was not planning on talking about the course at all. And I know that that's not also why you invited me. You just wanted to talk about this topic to like share right. with people who listen and that it is a really important topic. And mm -hmm. it's not one of the things that we chat about. And it's quite hard to make into like a super, you know, jazzy topic. Right. So I appreciate the space to talk about it because I actually think it is pretty interesting. But also thanks for mentioning my course as well, because I do like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, 
you know, I think when the overwhelm of someone who's maybe just finding out about this, they can Google, they can chat GDP, whatever they want to do, but to know that there's something put together by someone who has looked at every aspect of it, where it's all in one, they can just show up to the space after they've purchased and find everything they need in one place. And of course you always do top level trainings. So oh, I know that is good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so nice of you. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So any last thoughts before we start wrapping up? Yeah, I don't know. Like, what do you think about, you know, when, when we talk about, cause we've talked about this topic before and we've done kind of trainings on it and, you know, I've done trainings in different groups on it and things like that. Like, what do you, when you think about who you'd like to choose, like what are the qualities and what are the things that you sort of hope for if you needed to take some time off, let's say just for a few months, even, you know, as a result of like our conversations and things, what are you left with thinking and hoping for? That's such a good question. I think that finding somebody who sort of matches your values and the way you show up as a therapist would be important, not necessarily your same therapeutic orientation or treatment modality, but someone who's maybe personality or their presence is more similar to yours. That would feel a little more comfortable to clients, I think. But it is, it is this big, like it feels overwhelming. This is a lot to ask of somebody. And I so agree with your point of it needs to be somebody who can do a good job, but not somebody who's really close to you, who's already going to be struggling. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I like all those things as well. And I think also sometimes we we choose people out of practicality as well. But I think mm -hmm. it's nice to have that much thought and kind of care and like what we hope for as well, you know, in the process. And what I wish for all of us is that we, you know, do all of this work on our clinical will and we never have to use it and that we all retire with plenty of time and, uh, you know, destroy all our own documents uh, appropriately. <laughs> yeah <laughs> in the way that we need to and that's mm -hmm. that's what I wish you know for everybody but in in the unfortunate event that it might not happen that way for everybody I hope that this is a bit helpful right it's a, a nice thing to just know it's checked off the list you don't have to you know you do need to update it periodically but it doesn't have to be front of mind all the time but it's something that and and we all care about our clients that's why we do this work you know, we want them to be taken care of. So we want to make sure that in that event, because our clients are going to grieve too, it's going to be hard for them. And they need to hear from somebody who can not only share the news in an appropriate, loving way, but also make referrals and answer questions and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thank you for coming on here. So you have a catchphrase that we talked about a little bit, but you sort of referenced it. So I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. Any document is better than no document, right? Who am I copying? Who am I <laughs> <laughs> well, so a few weeks ago, I had Melissa McCaffrey on. We were talking about progress notes and her advice, which is so relevant to so many areas of her life, was mm -hmm. any progress note is better than no note. So any type of professional or clinical will is better than none at all. So. Absolutely. Anything like a client list, a document with all of your renewal dates, a list of your platforms and subscriptions, literally any information is better than no information. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for coming on today. I put you on the spot at the last minute, so I appreciate you stepping up and helping me out. Plus, are we laugh so much more than this but it's kind of hard to have a lot of laughing with this topic so it's just not a laughing I mean honestly maybe I should write some jokes to go with it or I don't really know like it's such an important topic but I've never managed to find anything but I never even find any like awkward jokes with it really it's just a practical yeah. thing yeah. and anyway thanks so much for giving me space to share about it it is really important for everybody in our profession to hear about and um, thanks for inviting me on because yeah, you know absolutely. how much I love podcasts. <laughs> okay, so Tamara hates podcasts. So <laughs> I asked her at the last minute to do this no. and said, totally okay to say no. But being such a great friend, she stepped up and was like, okay, I can do this for you. 
So yeah, and I love this topic. (laughs) And also I'm just afraid. It's not that I hate podcasts. It's that I'm afraid of podcasts. (laughs) I'm afraid. I'm afraid of podcasts. I'm afraid of saying something silly, but it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And so thanks so much for the space. Yes. Thank you as well. And be sure to check the show notes. So we'll have some information for you to be able to reach tomorrow. For everyone listening, there are new episodes of the Colleague Down the Hall podcast released every Thursday on all major platforms. Please remember our work is hard. It doesn't have to be lonely. Thank you so much for listening to the Colleague Down the Hall podcast. For show notes, links, and downloads, head over to colleaguedownthehall.com where you'll be able to learn more about getting the clinical support you need and resources to help you work in a supported, sustainable way. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share with your therapy friends and colleagues. Subscribe to the podcast. And if you love this episode, please leave a review.